This time on Animal Airport, vet checks for some sick animals rescued from a private zoo. Dear. Stuart gets to grips with a tricky skunk. Hey. <laughs> Tara looks after a rare cat that's arrived in the UK without its coat. That cat is not good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and the team hunts down a reptile on the loose in the hold of a plane. <laughs> London Heathrow, one of the world's busiest airports. Every year, 500,000 flights arrive and depart, carrying 70 million human passengers and 40 million animals and fish. And while the humans report to passport control, the animals head to the animal reception centre, known as the Ark. The teams responded to an emergency call. An RSPCA raid on a private zoo means the Ark is now providing temporary accommodation for more than 40 exotic animals. They'll stay here until the RSPCA can find them new homes. This is a big influx of animals for us, yeah, to get this many, and the variety as well. But they've been kept in inadequate conditions and many are in poor health. For now, it's the Ark's job to return these animals to full fitness. The priority today is to check the condition of seven meerkats, four owls, a pair of coates, and a lone striped skunk. Each animal presents its own challenges. The team needs a specialist, so joining Supervisor Stewart is zoo vet Steve. We always have to have a vet in to, you know, to do his examination because we, we can say that, you know, visually the animal, you know, doesn't look in good condition, but we need, like, you know, an expert. Stewart's been at the Ark for 19 years. Before that, he was deputy head keeper at a zoo looking after primates and big cats. I think I got basically employed because of my exotic experience, which has come in quite handy since, to be fair. First on their rounds are the meerkats, known collectively as a gang. The best way to catch meerkats is with a net. Stuart must hold them still long enough for Steve to get a good look at each one. Meerkats may look harmless, but their cute appearance belies their razor-sharp teeth. My main concern is obviously not getting bitten and also make sure the vet doesn't get bitten. He's a feisty one, this mm. one. Thank you. Yeah, got me. Brilliant. Hey, 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 that's my finger. The gang of meerkats is checked, wormed and treated for fleas and parasites. All right. But Steve notices something wrong with some of the meerkat's feet. He's got blood on both. Yeah. Yeah. He needs to get a good look at their injuries, so he removes the hair surrounding the wound. All right. Although it looks red, there's no fresh, wet blood there. I wonder if it's just caught its nail on something. Some of them have got like small bouts of blood on their on their feet. Um, the vet's examined them, doesn't seem to be any wounds there at all, so it's probably an old, an old injury. The RSPCA may want to take legal action, so there needs to be photographic evidence of any potential neglect. How come their claws are so long? Is it because they haven't been able to they forage? Have, they, they, they've had nowhere. Nowhere to dig, scrabble, no, nothing hard in there at all to, to wear the claws down as they use them. So this is like a luxury. Yeah, this is nice. Oh, life's tough. Oh, dear. Once their overgrown claws have been clipped, the meerkats can settle back into their luxurious accommodation. But there's no rest for Steve and Stuart. Animal health officer Tara is unloading a large shipment of reptiles that have come all the way from a specialist breeder in Canada. Whatever the label on the box might say, no chances are taken. Opening reptile shipments can be dangerous, especially if some of the animals have escaped, so packages like these are only inspected under supervision. Deputy Manager Tristan's on hand. Reptile shipments often contain hundreds of animals. 
the ARC team is only required to check 10% of the consignment. As they open the final box, Tara picks up an unpleasant smell. The only way you're going to find out what's in there is by, by opening the, uh, the top and having a look in carefully. I haven't even opened the bag yet. No, you haven't. There's one the stuck in the top. I can Aww. see it. Right, let me just um, have a quick look at that. This is the smell that we could smell when we just opened up the box. It looks like this um, animal was trying to escape when this uh, was being tied up by the exporter. And it gets caught up in the bag. There's that one there, which is uh, deceased. Oh, no. And there's a second one. Most of the shipment is intact, but three geckos are dead. Your best bet is to turn your glove inside out on them. Oh, that's gross. There you oh, go. Oh, that's gross. I don't like it. And then uh, we can knock the uh, bag up and put a tag on it. The importer can pick them up if he wants to, but more often than not, they uh, leave them here. But at least we can show them what's happened to them. The geckos will be frozen and kept as evidence in case there's a dispute. The rest can continue their journey. Supervisor Stewart and vet Steve now need to catch and examine the four owls. It's not always easy to spot if a bird is sick. Signs of illness could be hidden by an owl's thick, downy feathers. Visually, they look good, but let's get some hands on and actually have a feel. If the owl were to take flight in this confined space, it could seriously injure itself. But Stuart has years of experience with birds of prey. Hey, hey, hey. Turn around. He knows exactly how to handle them. So you'll realise with the birds of prey legs, they're like this, probably this one of the strongest parts of their body, because that's where all the force goes when they're catching the prey. So holding them by its legs doesn't do it any harm. It's a legal requirement for these captive birds of prey to be ringed with an individual identification number. But two of the owls don't have rings. Steve will have to find a temporary way of recognising each bird. Livestock spray will do the job, but as they go to mark the second owl, there's something wrong. I'll just see if they got any start of a bit of an infection. This owl has developed lesions on its claws, a condition known as bumblefoot, and it's contagious. You can get it from you know, fecal contamination, um, overlong talons, inappropriate perching, things like that, all, all can contribute and they get an infection in the tissue of the foot. Um, because there's not much tissue there, it can quickly damage um, important tendons, joints. Untreated, this owl might lose its foot. So they apply antibiotics to the wound. It's the week running up to Crufts, the world's biggest dog show. And the Ark is rolling out the red carpet for an influx of canine royalty. Animal health officer Mel is a lady in waiting. We get lots of dogs from all over the world flying into the UK just for a couple of days to go to the Crufts show and then fly it again. Mel's been at the Ark three years and owns an Akita called Hudson. For her, big is beautiful. I don't like little dogs, I like big dogs. So if it's a day full of Shih Tzus and Chihuahuas and Maltese, I'm not really too enthusiastic. But you know, if it's the big boys in, then I'm quite happy. A championship dog must always look its best. Worth thousands of pounds each, it's not surprising their owners often ask for special treatment. We do get requests from them to have the animals stay in the boxes so their fur doesn't get ruined, because obviously they have them groomed and styled before they come over. Because it had been on an eight-hour flight, I mean, animal welfare comes first. We're going to put the poor thing straight back in the box. But not all dogs are judged on their looks. For this one, it's about his performance. Here we have got a very pretty border collie that's come in from Finland for the craft show this week. Poonzi is an agility dog. He'll be racing against the clock to complete an obstacle course. I'll have a quick look at the passport now because it's from Finland and they don't need a tapeworm treatment, so I literally just need to look at two dates in here and that's it. It's absolutely fine, so he's passed. 
It's a nice and easy, quite simple one. Punzi's now off to the athlete's village. He thinks it's a big game. He's going to love running around the ring and jumping over things and going under things. For his owner and coach, the trip's been a big investment. It's very expensive to fly here. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it takes about 3,000 euros from us to fly here with the dog. So when you have this opportunity, I'm not worrying about the money. <laughs> Punzi's not worried either. Oh, here he is. After a four hour flight, he's keen for a run around, and his owner doesn't miss an opportunity to show off. <laughs> Stuart is preparing to take on the largest and strongest of the rescue animals, the male coati. Males can be twice as big as the females, with strong limbs to climb trees. When cornered, they can be highly aggressive. Stuart is understandably anxious. This is the only one I'm not looking forward to. He's such a hench. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pin him down. He needs the area clear. If I can't hold it, I'm going to let it go. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And I'm worried about everybody else getting bitten. So. If I can't hold it, I'll let it go and re-catch it. Defences are in place. The team braces itself. A loose coati in the building could cause chaos. Only when Stuart's ready will they release. London Heathrow handles nearly 1,300 flights a day. There can be up to 200 planes on the ground at any one time. With only 125 stands at the terminals, parking is at a premium. Animal health officer Grace is on her way to meet two dogs arriving on a flight from Istanbul. Um, this is our stand, but there's an Emirates flight on it, so this one looks as if it's going out. Aircraft need to be on stand for at least an hour so they can offload and prepare for their onward journey. As one flight leaves, the plane from Istanbul can take its place. But getting close to it can still be a problem. A lot of the, the like cargo lorries try and get in there first, and especially when it's on a really small stand and there's loads of massive lorries, it's really hard to try and figure out where you're going to park. Parking's not the only difficulty when collecting animals. Communication can be a problem, too. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> you OK with that? Yeah, that's fine. No, it's fine. Off first is Jerry, a Chihuahua cross, closely followed by Millie, pointer cross, who's been busy during her five-hour flight. Uh, one of the dogs has uh, pooed in its box and it's a bit smelly and it's kind of smeared it all around. It's a rare treat for Grace to look forward to when she gets back. At the Ark, the team is preparing to inspect the strongest animal in the building, the male coati. Well, I'd rather we have a bit of space. Well, I'll let it out and I'll just have to... Oh, that didn't work. Oh, God, he's nowhere to grab it. Hang on. I've got him now. I'm going to have to towel him. Do you want to towel or do you want to see him? Yeah. Towel him, go on. Oh, yep. Yeah. I haven't really got him, to be honest. It's not a large animal, but Stuart still needs all his strength to restrain it. Yeah. Oh, you're as strong... Jesus! He needs to keep it still long enough for vet Steve to perform the examination. There you go. Good. He's built like a brick. Um, I don't think there's anything physically wrong with him, was there, Steve? Yeah, I'm quite pleased with him. He's in, he's in good condition. He's definitely not weak. Having grappled with the largest and strongest of the rescue animals, Stuart now needs to net a defensive skunk. 
and unusually, he's not sure how to handle it. Shh. Quite a big animal, you can sort of scruff it, but he's got such a thick neck. On the other hand, I can't get my hands round it to hold to hold its neck. It might be easier to actually let him back out of there and towel him. Yeah. Rather than trying to get in that net and get hold of him. All right, mate. Ah, 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 ah. So calm down a second. Don't go in there. They need to give it flea treatment and trim its claws, but the skunk has other ideas. Ish. Aye. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sore, mate. It got good. It's quite deep as well. Veterinary checks completed. The ARC staff can now tailor individual treatment programs to bring the animals back to full health. Grace has arrived back with the messy pointer cross. Millie is keen to get out of her dirty box. Um, if she has a lot of mess on her, then we will wipe her down, but we'll let her out into a kennel and see what she's like. Dogs shouldn't normally be fed before travelling. When they are, there can be consequences. Sometimes they've no choice but to relieve themselves in their box. She seems quite lively, but I think she just wants to get out. And I would want to get out of that box as well. Come here. She looks pretty clean, so she hasn't got any dirt or poo on her. So she'll be all right. We'll make sure she's OK when she's in there. But she seems fine. Don't you? You're going to go in? Get her tail going. <laughs> All that's left for Grace to do is complete Millie's checks and clean out her box. Then she can be on her way. Animal health officers Michelle and Tara are unloading a regular shipment of cats just in from Cyprus. The Ark knows the species and number of animals it's got to collect, but is rarely notified of the breed. Amongst the six cats is a sphinx called Luna. That cat is not good looking. <laughs> sphinx cats are a rare breed born without any fur, which makes it difficult for them to conserve body heat. And this cat has some unusual packaging. And the owner, in being, I don't know, being overly careful, has decided to insulate the box, covering up all the air holes. It's borderline whether she should have, he or she should have done it or not, because they need the air holes for the ventilation in the box. But at the same time, I know how chilly they can get, particularly where it's come from to here and how cold it is. But a few air holes would have been a bit better. Mm -hmm. Tara takes the crate into quarantine to remove the insulating foil and to say hello to this not so furry feline. Are you a friendly little bald cat? Oh, you are. I don't want a scruff when he doesn't have a scruff. Oh, no, look at his tail, look at his... Oh, God. I mean, he feels really warm. Luna's woolly jumper seems to be doing a good job. <laughs> there you go, you're all done. <laughs> Rare breeds require special care, as Luna's owner knows only too well. We use hot water bottles when they go to sleep, and just like lots of blankets, and they've got loads of places they can snuggle up, like cat beds and stuff that my mum has for them. Um, and that's why they eat so much food, because they burn it off like with the heat trying to produce to keep warm. Sphinx cats should never be allowed outdoors on their own, as the cold could kill them but the temperature inside the quarantine wing is closely regulated. The Animal Reception Centre deals with more than 200,000 reptiles a year, most of them destined for the pet trade. But tonight they've had an urgent call. There's a reptile stowaway loose in the hold of an aircraft from Africa. 
Animal health officers Tara and Kaylee are on shift. Gloves, George. We just got a call about a uh, reptile or gecko type thing on a virgin plane out in the airport. So me and Tara are going to go out and try and see if we can catch it. Stowaways are rare, and Tara and Kaylee don't even know the size or species of what they're about to come up against. I don't have a plan yet. There is no plan. They're going in blind. The reptile hiding in the hold could be venomous. Once they're in, they spot it. It's a lizard, and it might bolt at any moment into the belly of the plane. But as the pair move in, it barely moves. This lizard's been in the freezing hold for hours. I'd gonna guess an agama, agamid. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not all that clued up on my lizards, and there's so many of them that could be anything really. I'm surprised they saw that. Mm. It's tiny. Agama lizards are normally found on the warm African plains. Some agamas can run on their hind legs at high speed. It seems Tara and Kaylee got lucky. When they get cold, they tend not to be able to move too quick. So yeah, he made it fairly simple for us to catch him. He wasn't really a challenge at all. <laughs> Animal detained, and they decide to name him. I think we should call him Dave. Dave. Dave, after the man who found him. Hope he doesn't mind his name being shortened. Daniel. Daniel. Oh, Dave, Daniel. I like Dave better. Back at the Ark, they take a closer look at their captive. You'll be OK, I hope. They need Stuart to confirm the species. It's a little agam, isn't it? High five. Well done. High five, I'm learning. Yeah, looks like a little agam. Tara's initial guess was correct. The Agama will now be housed amongst the other reptile residents until a permanent home is found. The seized zoo animals have settled in at the Ark. When they arrived, they were underweight, but their rehabilitation is now underway. Normally, Ark residents are fed once or twice a day, but animal health officer Grace has been giving these hungry animals the full menu. They're needing more food each day, so we're giving them more meal times. So they're going to have, I think, a breakfast, a lunch, something kind of after lunch, and then dinner, and then something else. Each animal is on a diet plan adapted to their specific requirements. He normally eats fruit and veg, but he's got more veg this time. Every meal is individually tailored, freshly prepared by the team and delivered to their door. What's this? And all the hard work seems to be paying off. Feed you up. Thanks to the team's commitment, these animals are already making good progress. They're all stable now, weights are good, conditions are, have improved. Um, I'm happy with all the animals now, really, so it's just a case of keeping an eye on their husbandry and making sure that we don't have any issues as time goes on. Punsi, the agility dog, made it through to the second round of Crufts. Luna, the bald cat, is now being used for breeding and is expecting a litter of kittens. And the RSPCA animals remain at the Ark, waiting to go to new homes.